There are many different types of sharks in the world, and each one looks a little bit different so they can live perfectly in the environment that they live in. Let's check out the different types of environments that sharks live in. So in our Pacific Ocean and our shoreline habitats, we have kelp forests. And in those kelp forests, we have these sharks called the leopard shark. Now, the leopard sharks live in the kelp forest or the rocky reefs. They don't really have any danger to humans. They're foraging on the bottom for crabs and shrimp and squid and fish and um, fish eggs even so they can eat and forage on the bottom. We also have the horn shark. Now, the horn shark is a really cool shark. It has a really short snout that allows it to um, uh, eat some really cool stuff. It has really it has plate like jaws, like kind of like stingrays, so they crunch their food and they eat a lot of sea urchins. We a lot of purple sea urchins, and they have two large venomous spines right in front of their two dorsal fins, right here and here. So during the day, they stay motionless, and they have those big old globe-like pectoral fins that allow them to hang on to the rocks, and they or with the algae, and uh, they can stay there kind of alert, but still relaxing and resting. And then when the night hits, uh, they're nocturnal. They can be really active in search for food. Now, kind of a funny um, thing about them is they're very clumsy. They kind of like to push themselves around the bottom to find those things on the bottom. And their, um, their spines, those two spines, if they eat a lot of sea urchins, they actually turn purple. It's really crazy. I've seen it before. But they will turn purple if they eat too many, um, too many purple things. This is their egg casing, and I show you guys one of these as well during the shark dissection, but they're a spiral shape, and that allows them to spin around, and the baby shark um, to be rested in this egg casing, and it allows them to be able to camouflage so they're not, uh, they're not in having a problem. The benthos is what we call the bottom of the ocean, so usually the sandy layer or the rocky layer of the ocean. On this level of the ocean, let's go to the African coast. We have the African angel shark. Now, angel sharks are one of the quickest reflex sharks. You see how flat they are, almost like a stingray? They bury themselves up under the sand, and any time a fish comes over them, they're actually able to be really quick and grab them. Let's watch a video to be able to see how quick those reflexes are. Oh, there it is. I'll show you one more time how quick that is. It's crazy, but they're specifically adapted to be able to do that. They can hide really well, and it allows them to eat all the food that they want um, and eat whenever there's an opportunity. Let's go to seagrass beds. Seagrass bed is a little bit different than algae. Turtles love seagrass beds. Let's find out what shark likes to live in the seagrass beds. Here in the Gulf of Mexico, we have a lot of seagrass beds, especially in Florida and even in Galveston. So we have our nurse sharks. You probably are familiar with those. Um, they uh, have a curled hinged mouth, and it's actually what their scientific name is named after. These guys um, kind of stay in one space. Uh, they don't really move around too much, and they are active during the day. And they don't need to keep moving to be able to breathe. We also have bull sharks that live in the salt, the sea grasses that kind of hang out there and find their um, their prey there. Uh, bull sharks are very territorial. You probably know these guys as the ones who go into rivers. They actually will lay their eggs in rivers. They'll swim up um, and not lay their eggs. I apologize. Have their babies in the rivers, so they will actually birth their babies live and have them kind of in the river system so they're more protected. They have um, a really cool ability to survive in freshwater that not every shark is able to do. They have a rectal gland that allows them to um, quickly process that 
that salt and change, um, the salty layers, the, the, uh, change in salinity really, really fast. And they can get up to 13 feet in length. They love eating flounder and flounder love staying in the sea grasses. Now we have another term that, that we call pelagic. Pelagic means middle of the ocean. So the open ocean is what pelagic means. Open ocean in the Gulf of Mexico for us is the flower garden banks. It's our coral reef system. Not a lot of people are actually familiar with the flower garden being banks, but it is one of the most productive coral reefs in the world right now. So it's really cool and we're really lucky to have them. So for those open uh, open water sharks, we have our whale shark. Uh, this is the largest of the shark species. It can reach 40 feet in length, which is crazy. They have all these beautiful spot patterns um, around their body. Um, and they are filter feeders. They're so, so huge, 40 feet in length. And all they eat is plankton. They eat the tiny plankton. If you've seen SpongeBob, um, the little green guy from, from SpongeBob is actually called a copopod. They eat copopods, krill, small fish, and they open their mouth really, really wide and just scan through the water, sifting through the water, kind of like a bowl of spaghetti, all day. They're very friendly. They're not a threat to humans at all. They actually don't really have really big teeth. You see it opening its mouth now. They have a layer of teeth right at the opening, but they're really t small. They're really not made for catching food. What they do is they open their mouth, gather all the plankton and krill, close their mouth, and whenever they do that, the water squirts out their gills, leaving behind all the plankton, krill, small fish that they can so they can eat. And they have to eat all day constantly so they can be able to uh, grow big and strong. Another pelagic shark is the black tip shark or the black tip reef shark. So these guys um, are really cool. We have them in Galveston. They take 12 to 18 years to mature, which is a little bit older. Um, they don't reproduce quickly either, um, and they only have a few young, so we need to protect these guys. Um, but they have specific requirements uh, for them to be able to have their babies. And these guys, the babies are uh, in their mom. They have ovoviviparous birth, where the mom lays eggs in um, their uterus. The babies survive off the yolk sac, and then they are birthed live. And they can actually hold their babies for up to two years in their uterus uh, before finding a time that they can have their babies. So this kind of allows them to make sure their babies are um, strong and healthy before sending them out into the world just because they have so many different, um, so many barriers to having adult black tip sharks. So it's really cool. That's one way that they've adapted to um, to their environment and, and being able to have their babies holding them in for a little longer. We also have the bonnet head sharks. Uh, these are the smallest of the hammerhead family. They only get to about four feet um, and they have a really large face just like hammerhead sharks. They will uh, scan the under the sand and be able to prey on crustaceans and small fish and um, and things like that and uh, be able to find them whenever they can't um, see underneath the sand. So they have all those ampullae of Lorenzini that will go crazy whenever they there's something underneath the water. We also have the great hammerhead shark, which is the same. Now, great hammerheads usually travel in huge, huge packs, which is really cool. Uh, exactly like those bonnet heads, they have great electroreception and great vision, and they all go in groups, which is really cool. These guys can get up to 18 feet in length, so pretty large. We also have the thresher shark, and the thresher, thresher shark um, is another pelagic shark that has a really large tail. The tail is 33% of its entire body. Let me mute this. And they will whip it back and forth 
in order to um, to hunt their prey. So let me skip a little bit so you guys can see. We call them the Indiana Jones shark because it uses this big tail, not for swimming and not to go really fast. It actually uses it as a whip, just like that. Whenever it whips that tail, it's able to hit fish. And whenever it hits those fish, it can stun those fish. They say it's anywhere from three to seven fish, depending on how many fish are in one area and how quick that tail whip is. But they can whip those fish and swim back around and then go eat them later, which is really cool. I like to call them the couch potato of the sea because it's probably the laziest way of getting food other than the whale shark. Um, of the shark species. But these guys are also open ocean pelagic sharks. Okay, so in the open ocean, a little bit more, let's go to the African coast, we have our famous great white sharks. Now great white sharks uh, are the most famous ones, especially for the music, uh, the movie Jaws. Um, they're the largest predatory fish on the sea, and they can live for like 25 years and can be around 20, 25 feet long. Um, but there are a lot of different um, ways of feeding for great white sharks, and it's a little bit different from their environment. So let me skip a little bit here so you guys can see breach. So great white sharks will actually breach out of the water to find marine mammals. The ones that live off the South African coast kind of have learned to kind of live in the kelp, kind of skulk in the kelp reefs and shoot up into the water to catch these fur seals. There's a place called Seal Island that you probably have heard of. And so the great white sharks will come right out of the water. Grab, this is a decoy in this. And they can throw their bodies out of the water and surprise their prey. They have a really uh, strong tail that allows them to propel their body out of the water. And the ones in South Africa are the only ones that really do this. Uh, the ones off the California coast will eat uh, large fish, but the ones in South Africa are eating marine mammals. And so that makes it a little bit different. Um, for their feeding strategy, for what they're going to grab and what they're going to eat. So we also have spinner sharks. Uh, we actually have these on the Gulf Coast as well. Uh, they're pretty, they're all pelagic and they will um, jump straight out of the water and do a spin-like motion. It's really cool. Another type of breaching shark. You see it? There it goes. And again. So those guys are the acrobat sharks. They'll spin and spin and spin. It's really cool to see. Okay, we also have our sand tiger sharks. These guys are the ones that have ovo or are ovoviviparous, but they have interuterine cannibalism. So what happens is the babies will live in the mom's uterus, and they will live off of their yolk sac. And once their yolk sacs are all taken up, they're still a little hungry. So the largest of the shark starts to eat all the other babies inside of the uterus and so they're uh they do that they eat all of its brothers and sisters and the strongest one will actually be the survivor and so that one will be the one that gets birthed so really it only births one even though multiple are um formed in the uterus Mako sharks are the fastest in the water. They can have bursts of 60 feet per uh, 60 miles per hour, um, and average 35 miles per hour. Um, usually six to nine feet long. They can get a little bit bigger. These guys are, like I said, pelagic, and they want to eat those really really fast fish like tuna. So that um, that being able to reach that those fast fast 
beads allow to them to be able to catch their prey. Now the last environment, the deep sea. Some animals use bioluminescence and they produce light from light. That's what bioluminescence means, light produced by light. Uh, sometimes it's used for mimicry to mimic other uh, animals that use bioluminescence to attract other sharks or mates, uh, distraction and communication. So whenever you're producing light, so if you think of the angler fish, the angler fish like in Finding Nemo will have that lure and be able to eat fish. Um, so bioluminescence is usually what those deep sea organisms will use to uh, find their prey and survive. So the cookie cutter shark um, is uh, one of those really kind of crazy sharks. Uh, if you look at these jaws, it's a perfect, perfect circular little saw that they have. And what they do is they find fish or marine mammals and they cut a perfect circle out of their body. They basically take a plug of, of meat um, out of the... Um, out of their prey and it's kind of almost like they're parasitic in a way they take one bite and or two and then they go on to the next prey so they just kind of hold on and turn their body and basically kind of like a cookie cutter cut a little piece of the the um, meat out of that animal it's kind of crazy we also have the goblin shark now this gnarly shark has a really cool adaptation what they do is they actually can expand their jaws. So what happens in this video, there's a diver's arm. When he pulls his arm back, the goblin shark expands his jaws because they're not exactly connected and throws out his jaws. They're just connected by the thin layer of skin and can grab onto the prey as it's moving away. Now don't worry about this diver, he's wearing chain mail, so he's perfectly fine. But this is a great example of how these guys are able to survive really well in their environment. If something's swimming away, they can just pull it right back. And that's what the shark looks like in its normal environment. Kind of like a platypus. Another really cool species of shark is called the dwarf lantern shark. Now this is a species of shark that uses bioluminescence. And it is fierce and mighty and everyone put out your hand, it could fit in the palm of your hand. They say dwarf lantern sharks are only about six inches long. And they use this, um, this bioluminescence by using photophores around their body and their fins to help them camouflage and as well to attract smaller animals so they can be able to eat them. They also have really big eyes and you can see in that bottom picture of how it's reflecting that using that night vision, using that tapetum lucidum, that silvery layer in the back of their eye so they can be able to see through those dark waters um, whenever they can't at all because there's no light in the deep sea. It's so far down and the deep waters that they won't be able to see. The Greenland shark, also called the silky shark, um, is a um, it's kind of like it look like a grandpa. Uh, their jaws are really funny looking. It almost looks like they have uh, dentures but their teeth are designed to take out plugs of flesh almost like the cookie cutter shark. But they eat dead stuff, dead and decaying material. So usually whenever you have like a whale carcass at the bottom, these guys are trying to eat on those and they can be pretty big. And some of the oldest sharks to, been, to have been found have been Greenland sharks. Um, their, their flesh is actually poisonous. They kind of secrete this poison. So you actually have to bury their, their um, people do eat them. Um, so you actually have to treat their their skin and their meat to make sure that they're good for human. So it's pretty cool. And it's the only subarctic shark, the ones that can, they can last in cold, cold temperatures. Now the last one is the frill shark. Now frill sharks can have a uh, gestation period for up to 3.5 years. Um, it's pretty pretty crazy. They uh, can live in really deep depths uh, between 160 to 660 feet depths. So 
they can live really deep in the ocean and they have this really long tail that allows them to kind of propel and move their body and helps them to maneuver. It's really not for speed, it just helps them to maneuver. And they have these really cool frill-like teeth that allow them to catch their prey as well. So deep on the bottom of the ocean of the sea, you can find these frill sharks. Not many of these guys are actually have been seen in the wild. But you see those frilly gills and they look very happy. But in those teeth, they have razor-like sharp teeth that can um, grab their prey. You guys see that big eye again? That big eye allows for light to come through and be able to see the different sharks. So you see those rows and rows of razor-like teeth. So they can hold on to their prey. They're pointed backwards like barbs. So if something's trying to swim away, they can just grab them. So pretty cool. They really come up to the surface only to pass away. Um, so usually something is going wrong for them to come to the surface and to be found. They like to hang out in the deep sea. So we don't really know how many there are in the world right now. But uh, it's really cool that we can kind of see them. So you guys have a challenge this week. Your challenge is to create your own shark. What I want you guys to do is to kind of cre even create your own environment for the shark to live in. Create a specific adaptation, the, a really cool feature of your shark that they can do to survive in their environment. So say you have a bubblegum shark and this bubblegum gum shark swims in candy land and to find its prey what it does is it blows a bubble it captures the fish in the bubble and then is able to eat it that's my version of a shark but you can think through what it's going to eat where it's going to live what its name will be what its scientific name will be and kind of see and kind of come up with something really awesome and add it to our flip grid explain to us you can show us a picture you can show us a video you can talk about it whatever you'd like i'd love to see what crazy ideas we can come up with for a crazy shark to live in um, the environment so make sure you check out the uh, shark week challenge create your own shark and make sure you post it to flipgrid this week feel free to comment and i'll see you guys soon